Hello, this is Ro, and thanks to all Patreon supporters, we're here in Oslo at Inferno Fest 2022. Thanks for your monetary support, it means a lot, it means flight tickets and hotel for us. All right, that advertising talk is enough. We're here to have a Swiss couple, not like a relationship couple, if you know what I mean, called Belze. Uh, a very, very interesting and unique band uh, that we will soon try to uh, figure out for you people. And those of you who have no idea what's going to be, well, we're here for you. Let's welcome the dudes. Please, guys, introduce yourself. Who the fuck are you and why you are here with me? I'm Fabian from Bilzo, and I got uh, invited by this nice uh, gentleman with a jet. I'm Okoy from Bilzo, and uh, we know about uh, Rauta or Jerry, uh, like, you know, from his interviews from online, and I thought it'd be really cool to actually do something. So we agreed to have a talk. Yeah, this is really interesting. First of all, there's uh, many, many reasons why I find you guys fascinating. And not the least thing is that you play as a duo. We all know that a lot of bands, especially when we're talking about extreme metal, they're like three piece of minimum or four or five people. At least you have live members, but you guys do it just by yourselves. Why so? Why, 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 why did you decide to do that so two-member thing? Well, when we started the band, we actually um, tried forming a three-piece, like a power trio. And it just naturally progressed the way that we went through several bass players, but none of them would really uh, manage to get into it as much as uh, Okoye and myself. Because it just ended us uh, up being us two in a, in a bunker, writing music, playing, hanging out, and really forming something that we, we um, could get very passionate about. And the bass players always very bit on the side. So before our first show, we spontaneously um, decided to uh, just do it as a, as a duo. Yeah. And like adjusted the, the, the set up the equipment accordingly. Um, uh, I start, I was splitting my guitar signal originally when we were jamming together. And it just really um, progressed from there. And I realized uh, I can kind of fill up the sound in a certain way, which, you know, I mean, it's not replacing a bass player, but it's... Um, it's just befitting the music we make. That's that's the only reason we play as a duo. It's not we're not trying to like, you know, um, have a phantom bass player there, and because we can't find one, it's just we want to make the music we make. And um, I feel we've reached a point like sonically where I can uh, fill up that frequency range anyway uh, without it, you know, yeah. dist disturbing the music. So yeah. What one thing which really. Uh, got my attention when I was, you know, you setting up for the show, it was like, you play 10 string guitar, mm. which is even more rare thing as a two man band. Like, I mean, there are only a few bands in extreme metal that go even as far as like, what, I don't know, eight string or whatever, but 10 strings, that's, it's like a mess you got. Thing. So what's your story with well, the Yeah, well, I mean, it's, um, it's not really as, as like, uh, amazingly complex as a lot of people might think when you mention 10 strings. It's uh, based upon the BC Rich principle, like this one model from the 80s, from the early BC Rich era, um, which was created to um, basically the high four are doubled, two of them are, are tuned um, one to one, and the others are tuned in octaves. And it creates like a natural chorus effect, so you get like this full body sound. Okay. And I heard about the guitar when we were jamming as a two-piece and we wanted to expand in this sense, like the setup. So I decided to try out a BC Rich and purchased one, a really nice one from the 80s. And that really, that's where it took off. And um, I've been playing one ever since, but I play a, like a custom now, it's like a baritone. Um, the idea is basically, um, I'm, I'm tuned to A, it's quite deep. So it's like a more of a death metal sort of tuning, mm -hmm. a modern death metal tuning. Um, and yeah, I, I get these, you know, those high notes can become more brilliant because of the double strings. Yeah. So that is kind of a, like a good way to explain that, you know, not going into too much fairy parts. Um, but is there coming back when, once you have touched the 10 string instrument? It's like, can you even go to Max Cavalera setup? Like, okay, <laughs> only four strings needed. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's a good question, actually. Um, you know, in a horror scenario, say my guitar wouldn't arrive at a designated destination mm -hmm. for a show, then um, I might have to resort to playing a six string, which wouldn't be, you know, 
the end of the world, um, but it would be different. Um, it would just sound actually a lot more clear than it does right now, like more defined, mm -hmm. but with a little less breadth, you know? Yeah, yeah. So you kind of have, you lose something in order to achieve yeah. the kind of a mass of sound. It's come, for Bilzer specifically, um, you pronounce it Bilzer. Mm -hmm. uh, it's become uh, like an integral part of our setup, you know. Um, uh, yeah. So. Talking about Belzer, that name is kind of a weird because it obviously, uh, you know, creates uh, ideas like this is some German language related name. It doesn't really, you know, be something obvious like a lot of. Mm extreme metal band names tend to be like, okay, this is about war or this is about darkness. What's the story of the name? Um, it was like a bit of a sort of a, a flash eureka moment where I had this this one word from the Swiss German language. Um, it's, it's a word that not many people use nowadays very often. And it refers to, well, we use it in more of like a, um, a metaphorical sense, but in essence, it refers to like an action, like a, a striking action. Um, uh, say if you're firing or hitting something, or it's like an execution of power um, okay. without any designated um, uh, like point of entry or uh, goal. It's like a, that's why we refer to it as like a natural, um, like a natural explosion of, of energy or power. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Especially means also with excessive force. With like excessive force. Strike yeah. something with everything you got without considering too much the consequences of it. All right, okay, uh, cool. Now, one other thing besides the 10 string thing and the name and you being a duo is also uh, something that really made me wonder, especially when I was listening to you, uh, your music, and also, uh, you know, both on stage and beyond, beyond that, is that your music isn't so easily boxed. I mean, in, in terms of genre, you definitely have death metal elements, you definitely have black metal elements, but because of, for example, clean vocals and all that stuff, it becomes like quite harder. So how would you, as a person of the band, define your own music? I don't really like to define it that much. It's, yeah, it's, I know. It's, it's, it's for me, <coughs> personally, I mean, Okoi writes the music, mm -hmm. um, but my influence comes just from everything I listen to, which is classic rock, all kinds of, of metal as well. So it's just an amalgamation of, of all those influences, things I like. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, kind of staying true to those roots, to the things we really like, mm -hmm. while creating something new. But, uh, I mean, that's really Okoi, is the guy to uh, speak to, I would say. So how would you, if you have to be this advertising guy for the band, mm. like saying, <clears throat> Bilzer is, what kind of music exactly? Uh, I, I think it's just like, a, I mean, you have to put it into some sort of category of like, you know, extreme metal or whatever, you know. It's Especially for review guys, we're like, yeah, we need those. It's heavy music. Um, but for me, it's like honest and uh, very organic and um, um, atmospheric, mm -hmm. I would call it. So it has influences from everything that we listen to, like Fabian was touching on. You know, we listen to so many different types of music and I think where uh, we meet common ground when we're writing for this band is uh, atmosphere and power and energy and honesty. You also have a very varied ways of, you know, uh, doing the vocals. It's not just pure black metal screams, but they're definitely black metal kind mm. of a things, vocal sounds. Uh, you also have those kind of dead metallic parts, but there are lots of clean vocals. Mm. How did this kind of a uh, combination yeah, get well, born? I, I mean, uh, the first uh, few releases and mm -hmm. um, didn't really have much of that, but mm -hmm. I, I always wanted to um, play with it a bit more, and uh, I think that we started doing that on Hero. Mm -hmm. um, not everyone's cup of tea, but uh, that's cool. It's more like an experiment, really, to like, I feel it, it's another color on the palette, you know? I don't want to just write music in black and white, that's not really my thing, but uh, so I just think it gives the music another... Um, yeah, another foundation to, to build on. And, um, you know, I think it's befitting. It's a little, um, a little abstract sometimes, 
but I, I do it because it feels right. And um, that's really the, the only answer I can give. <laughs> that actually is a good bridge to the next question about the hero cover. First of all, the name itself is pretty like simple and all that stuff, but it doesn't really like sound like a extreme metal mm. album name. Not to mention the cover, which is like almost the opposite. When you mentioned this black and white thing in terms of describing ideas and how to execute them, but even further, when we compare it to classic 1990s black metal albums or even death metal albums, which might have a lot of color, but yours is both in, de in terms of design and colors very much like an extreme metal even. Is this mm -hmm. some kind of a message you're trying to put it, or is it more like a, just a sum of your ideas? Uh, yeah, um, I think that's a really good question. I, um, I think all of the colors that are involved specifically in Hero and will be involved in the coming releases, um, there is, um, for me, that has, it's, it's, um, it's inseparable um, from the content that we're, well, I'm trying to sing about. Like the past, history, philosophy, human emotions, existence, all that stuff. Like, um, for me, that's a very colorful um, topic. It's not black and white. I mean, I, I, I love the black and white essence of true black metal. We're not a black metal band, but I mean, we grew up with that as well. And I think there's a time and place for that, but um, I don't see the colors being out of place with the music that we make because, um, you know, I mean, it's a lot of like, Nietzschean things going on there. It's about it's about fire and it's about um, uh, personal um, growth and, and evolution. You know? uh, so for me, that that means colors and experiences and all that stuff. And for me, that uh, uh, might piss a lot of people off, but for me, colors and all that stuff is uh, far more uh, foreboding and menacing and. Um, and heavy <laughs> than just black and white. <laughs> I, I think I get your idea because it's kind of a natural, in a natural world, we actually live in a world of colors and especially nature, you know, colorful animals are usually the sign of nature as black and white is kind of like a, almost like a passe kind of a... Yeah, I mean, a, I mean, nature as you know it, as you see, is a beast, you know, it's a, like, it's a total, um, it can be an absolutely heartless machine that can destroy you and it can be something that you know gives you everything you need to. Yeah, yeah, that reminds me of that hero cover because it's almost like, you know, this kind of a white light with yellow and almost like a sun rays ready to <laughs> destroy you, which then again also gives life. So... Yeah, I mean, you see it in the figure. Like, yeah. You know, it's, it's about balance there. It's about the two sides of human nature mm -hmm. or the complexities of human nature. Um, I like to play with the dualities and not just them, but what happens in between, like yeah. the, the, the third, um, factor. Uh, the kind of a breaking point. Yeah, yeah. What happens when you uh, take dualities into question and um, and uh, build yourself upon them or or break them as well? You know, break the boundaries. So there's kind of an each and like questioning part, like like what what happens when you put matter into antimatter? And yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. <laughs> there's, um, there's a lot of like. It, I mean, the music is not there to revere Nietzsche mm -hmm. whatsoever, but I mean, I, he had a big part in my, my adolescence, you know, yeah. and uh, made a big impression on me, and definitely musically and, and the lyrics I write, so um, not just him, but many other thinkers as well. Right? But now, now I have to ask, because having re read a little bit Nietzsche and myself and, and, and also Schopenhauer, and knowing that they have this kind of a Far East, even kind of a Buddhist kind of link mm. in, in terms of uh, philosophy and all, and it seems quite natural, but a lot of people, especially coming from black metal uh, territory, tend to think that like, okay, Nietzsche is an like, end of all things, like it's like a Western philosophy, even though it goes a lot deeper. Uh, how much you have to kind of like counter these statements or questions or whatever, because now that you mention it and you open the box, like, yeah. Do people ask about it or make claims like, okay, you are one of these guys? Well, when I think about, you know, the beautiful thing about um, specifically touching on him again, his ideas and thoughts, it, well, you know, the literature that he left th that your common man can understand, mm -hmm. and I mean, um, half of it, 
um, most of us can't understand because it's just it's too way out. I mean, you have to. <laughs> um, but the stuff you can touch on, like Zarathustra, and you know, it's, it's all about the the big contradictions mm -hmm. and putting them into question and accepting that you are a contradiction yourself and uh, finding the beauty in that. You know, I think there's great uh, beauty and color to be found in that in that experience alone, in in knowing that you cannot know. I think that's a great thing. Now, that's a good excuse to talk about lyrics. If you have to sum up the lyrics of Bajar, obviously you have different topics and all, but if you had to kind of sum it up, like what it would be, how to describe the lyrics of the band? Uh, yeah, I guess um, in essence, uh, the things we've just mentioned, you know, like um, mm -hmm. it's a lot about personal experience, but put into a maybe a bit of a... Um, fictional story context based around historical um, constellations like the hero idea is like a loosely based on a heroic cycle mm -hmm. and the experiences of the protagonist within that cycle from uh, birth conception to death through um, personal battle and the, the, I guess the death of the spirit in essence and like the, the re-evaluation of oneself that was kind of the idea behind it Alright, now I'll turn to you now that we have mentioned all these lyrics and uh, hard to box in kind of a genres and uh, realizing that your duo which is al already mentioned quite a weird thing and you don't have a lot of different releases but you have a very, very strong cult following and people adore you for being very kind of a unique band. Where do you think all this appreciation stems from and this cult band following? Well, that's a tough question, but um, I mean, we noticed with the release of Aura there was a bit of a hype almost going on. It was a very, very steep curve suddenly of interest. Before that, it was, it was almost nothing. And uh, I guess it was the right time for that kind of release, but but now the people that actually stuck with us, and especially after Hero as well, because that was was very dividing for many people, especially mm -hmm. the extreme on the ground crowd. Polarizing, um, yeah. Polarizing, of course. Mm -hmm. Like the, the the responses I, I get uh, is often that they um, actually experienced something very personal to themselves, like they, they connected with, with personal um, things like uh, the live shows, for example, that they are very cathartic to them. The, what I hear often is, is, is that it helps them work out or through, during struggles. Uh, and that's also a bit what, what it is for me personally. It's very, very personal, you know, what I put into the band from my side. Um, it's, it's like that um, the connection me and Okoy have in a musical form getting fed by by our daily um, experiences here mm -hmm. it's hard to describe but but I think um, a lot of people can tap into that with their own lives and, and that somehow um, experience it from their own perspective but it's 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 something very open as well I would say it's not like it's, it's, it's honest you know yeah, there's not there's not much room for like this uh, any kind of you know we don't focus on um, elite elitist ideas surrounding ideology or mm -hmm. or um, religion or politics and all that shit you know because um, it's, if you do that if you choose to do that I guess you're you know you're insulating yourself and your fan base as well mm -hmm. and they can tap into what you're trying to project mm -hmm. uh, because we don't have in, anything to do with that kind of. Uh, those themes, then uh, it's, as Fabian said, more open. It's just, uh, for me, it's um, the, what, you would, what you would find in like a traditional quality 80s metal bands. Like mm -hmm. it, was, it, was like, it was like for your common man as mm -hmm. well. And I, that's the way I do see my, our music. It's, it's, like, it's like that as well. Maybe it's a bit more noisy and a bit yeah. more difficult to get into, you know, it's yeah. not, not as... Uh, more complex in a way. In a, in a way, because of just the way it is, you know, but, um, you know, factually it's, it's based around just honest human experiences, so, yeah. Now, 
you have done quite the opposite of, of, of many bands now that you have expanded with David Rowe and adding more clean vocals and you know, going the uh, the unusual way, whereas a lot of bands seem to be kind of like uh, narrowing their ways. And I mean, the, the terms how bands do, like, for example, a band starts a black metal style and then they start narrowing down what kind of ideas they can put into, both lyrically and also with riffs and all that stuff. And that can be, of course, a trap at the same time as it can be a possibility in, in terms of audience and success. Mm. But you are more like uh, going more open open ways in that respect. Do you think it will work out for you in a nice way or do you even give a damn? That's, that's a very good uh, point. Um, we don't. No, we don't give a, really a damn. I mean, we realize that um, the kind of music and the setup that we have, mm -hmm. um, it's kind of all quite, a, quite obscure. And it's not conducive to like you know mainstream success, and mm -hmm. that's not the idea behind the band at all. I mean, obviously, we would like to do as much as we can with it, mm -hmm. but um, we don't have any illusions of grandeur, you know, like um, yeah. of becoming this like you know filling a you know whatever large venue and selling it out as a headliner, and yeah. it's just not it's not not what we're about. So you're not ready to sacrifice some riffs in order to get your own Porsche? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, that would have happened a long time ago, I think. And I don't think that would even happen in any other project we yeah, do. Because yeah. we just don't... That's not the way we feel about music, yeah. you know? Um, I think it's really nice to see um, bands that can do that, can do that and, and can really make something um, amazing out of that success as well. Mm -hmm. I, I wholly support that. I think that's great. Um, but it's not something I want to pursue with this band. Yeah. All right. Now let's talk about a little bit your background in terms of country and all. You come from Switzerland, which is not exactly the metal capital of the world. I think that belongs to Finland, not that I care, but it always gets mentioned that especially uh, Nordic countries mm -hmm. are like very much, you know, having a lot of bands versus the population like per capita. But Switzerland, you have a lot of cult names, but then again, not too many bands as such. What's the story or more like, what's the scene, metal scene like in, in your perspective? When you think about it, you mean nowadays or nowadays or in general, how it has has been or changed or? Well, it's it's uh, a lot of small groups, I would say. Like every little city town uh, has, has their own scene. They do connect a little bit, but Swiss people are usually pretty closed in their circle, I, I would say. But uh, there's not that many bands that are really getting out of the country though. And that has to do also with, the, with the, probably the cost of living and just mm -hmm. the, the general standard people want to have here. It's just not possible to do that and have a band as well. Yeah, because I, I've got the idea that when you compare to bands from, coming from, for example, Norway and Sweden, they seem to go for kind of a mainstream in, in terms of the context, extreme metal. But when we're talking about Swiss band, it's more like you have one obscure band after another and everything is kind of unique and there is not so much like a uh, big commercial success or that big cult following. So does it have I, I, something to do with the mentality yeah, or what's yeah. the story? I don't think it's like, I don't think it's um, the Swiss <laughs> culture and mentality is, is you know, is... Um, it doesn't allow you to do that. It, no, not really. I mean, it, there's not enough focus on the arts and, mm -hmm. and expressing yourself with, with the arts and being accepted and uh, revered and supported um, uh, as a member of society who does that, um, as you do in Scandinavia or yeah. other countries. I think there's far more you know, support in that area. That, that's, actually, that's actually very true, especially with uh, you know, Sweden and particular Norway nowadays, but you, they get this kind of a uh, Spielmann Awards, which is like yeah, yeah. Grammy Awards, like, hey, you yeah. played a great black metal at that time, take this award, oh, you only did a nice Saturigon or whatever, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. that's like crazy thing, because back in the 90s, you wouldn't have like, oh, shit, yeah, it's that's, crazy. that's yeah, it's pretty crazy. crazy, but you don't have that in, no, in no, Switzerland. No, 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 no. I mean, uh, Tom, Tom G. Warrior hmm? recently got his first like official stately recognition as a like a you know an, an artist after forty years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> about the fucking time. And it was it was quite a quite an occasion like for him yeah. obviously. Yeah. Um, and for everyone else to see, it's like wow, okay. But it's still all very 
you know, very dry and, and like, ugh. I mean, the fucking Swiss music scene is like, is, we say it's a cult, you know, it's, a, yeah. it's like, <laughs> it's like, it's just full of like stuck up people that think they're hot shit and, and it's, that, that's kind of a shame because I mean you you are located in actually in the middle of Europe and you could have all the ways to go to different countries and but you're like okay like, let's make cuckoo blocks and we watch this. We're making the best out of that because um, from the very start we, we focused on, on the scene in Europe in general just traveled a lot and decided to not play too many Friday nights in Switzerland you know and instead just travel the world mm. well as soon as we could do that you know mm. so that, uh, I guess I guess the fact that we're a duo also enabled us to do certain things. It's cheaper to so. you. <laughs> yeah, and also what Fabian said before, um, which is not typically Swiss, um, um, you have to be willing to sacrifice like this, like uh, standard of living in a certain way, mm -hmm. you know, um, which a lot of people aren't, and it's understandable if you want to have a family. I mean, yeah. then forget it. You know, well. You can still do it, but I think it would be a lot more difficult. Yeah, lots of uh, compromises have to lots be Lots of compromises, absolutely. And because we're, we just have that lifestyle which you know, enabled us to be able to travel, it, it helped you know, to be able to play all over the world, really, in the first few years that we existed. So that was quite cool for us, yeah. All right. Yeah. Now we're heading towards the end of the interview, so a couple of random questions. If there would be one thing you could change with the music of your band, or just with the band, what would you change? Everything. Like everything. <laughs> everything. Okay, that's a big, okay. rather big question. No, seriously, if there's a, like one one thing or a bunch of things you could change, like, okay, we're builders, so we can uh, change what? That's uh, impossible to answer in, in, in one uh, sentence, but at the moment we are at, kind of at the crossroads, you know. We mm -hmm. feel like we are standing at the end of this, this cycle of the band and already begun working on the new one. So, uh, Basically, uh, going over everything we did in the past and uh, that we are doing still, and trying to, to find the uh, improvements and some new paths. So it's 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 actually where we are right now. You know, asking ourselves those questions, and it's just very complex. And but at the same time, we just follow, try to follow our, our hearts and uh, mm. stomach feeling. But I can't really pinpoint just. Uh, now this brings me to the one of the topics I forgot to ask earlier. I noticed your both of your styles is quite uh, physically heavy. I mean, you pound drums like a, like a, like a in a way that it, you, it's not some okay. I'm gonna touch these cymbals a little, little bit and all that stuff. But you kind of have a, the kind of a power. You also, when you move away from the mic, you do quite a bit of a kind of stretching and flexing and moshing and with your guitar. Uh, how taxing it is. How, how many years you can, you can move on with that kind of stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're, you're not old as Tom G, but, <laughs> but yeah, still. Yeah, yeah. Well, for me, the way I play it comes mm -hmm. very natural. It's just how I always did it. And uh, yep. so far, there are no issues there for the, I could do it a bit, a bit less, I, I guess. But I, I don't think, because I don't feel like I'm overdoing it, you know, mm -hmm. just for the purpose of hitting as hard as I can. Yeah. It's just the, the, the way I, I have to do it, yeah. What, what about you then? Like, is it mandatory to be this physical presence in the... In oh, dude, you know, I think, um, I think I could speak for both of us. Um, well, at least when I play on stage, when things are working out the way they should be, and there's this, like this energy um, uh, exchange going on between us and the audience, and then you get this cyclical thing going, and that's when a show feels good. Um, and you get, I, I'm, I'm not there anymore. Like I'm somewhere else, and that's where I want to be. You know, I want to be away. Okay. Uh, so I, I don't really, I just try and follow the natural energies of the music. You know. All right. And see where it takes me. Yeah. Well, now that you mentioned taking you someplace, where will you be taking those in a couple of years? Let's do a little bit of our foretelling. Yeah. Uh, um, Fabian touched on, you know, the fact that we're we're undergoing a lot of, you know, just a, a bit of a rejuvenation. Um, so there's going to be some new things happening very soon. Uh, we're writing new material uh, for t two albums, and um, yeah, there's a lot of good changes in the music. 
I mean, it's, it's for my opinion, it's it's bigger and heavier and um, more bombastic. It doesn't mean it's it's more mainstream at all. That's that's not uh, not what I mean. At all. I think um, people, if if people like what we do, what Bertha does, then they will like what we will do in the future. All right. So if you could pick one place above all else where would you play live, what place would that be? Any country, any city, or any kind of venue. I really like to play in a proper cave, like really down, deep down in the, in the earth. Like with a... Like a lot of reverb and echo. Yeah, just, and also the, 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 the um, danger of, of everything collapsing <laughs> at any moment. I don't know, that's just, a, yeah, I feel cool. All right, so people, promoters right there, find a cave and book these guys. Here to play and let's just hope with fingers crossed and all that shit that it's not their last one. Now people do your homework, get to see Builder live, I can pretty much guarantee it's worth it and if you cannot do that because I don't know you're a disabled or restricted person mentally or otherwise, <laughs> maybe you will just listen to the music on audio format and find out wow these guys are pretty goddamn good and unique. This is Rauta. Do your homework and get your shit done. Bye. I know this became kind of an abrupt ending, but <laughs> I, I wanted to avoid like everything because I I tend to ask more and more and more, and suddenly it's like.